Good evening. Welcome, everyone. I'm James Harding, editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And I'm really delighted this evening that you're here. Um, and critically, so is Bill Browder. Uh, you know the old expression, uh, by their friends shall you know them. Uh, in Bill's case, it's actually by their enemies. Um, <laughs> Bill, if you've, uh, uh, if you've read Bill Browder's book, Red Notice, you'll know it's about how uh, someone uh, like him, an investment manager, could become uh, Putin's enemy number one. And we're going to talk about Russia, we're going to talk about uh, corruption around the world, uh, and we're going to talk about, in particular, Bill Browder's story. Um, we're doing that in the context this week of thinking about the way the world is changing and being rewired by COVID-19. Um, part of our thinking has been that inevitably we're at a stage where we're really obsessed with things that are happening close to home. Uh, the impact of the lockdown, the state of the pandemic. And although globally we may all be doing the same things and not doing the same things, there's a sense that we're losing sight of what's happening in the rest of the world. And so it's particularly timely to have Bill Browder with us to think about a country like Russia and the way in which the state and the government there and Putin's government in particular is uh, reacting to the threat and in some ways the opportunity of the pandemic. Um, if you're a regular at Tortoise, you will know how a thinking works. It's an attempt to run what's in effect an open news meeting. We're trying to bring someone like Bill into our newsroom and then hear everyone else's different points of view. So we're not really after questions. In fact, we have a loosely enforced rule that a thinking doesn't have questions. What we want is your point of view. And so when you hear something that Bill says, you think, well, that sparks a thought, please do one of two things. Either hit the chat button, you know, you'll see that at the bottom of the screen, a little button that says chat. My um, uh, mighty colleague, the editor Liz Mosley, is there managing uh, the chat for all of us. Um, but also you can see there's a participants tab. If you hit that participants tab, you'll see there's a little gray box that says raise hand. If you raise it, uh, your digital blue hand will come up and I'll think, all right, we must make sure we bring you into the conversation. So please do that. It would be great. Uh, it would be really great to hear what you uh, have to say, what you think, whether it's about Bill Browder's story or whether you think it's actually more broadly about Russia and about uh, the, the issues that arise. Please do weigh in. We can't wait to hear what you have to say so that it's a conversation between all of us in this digital newsroom. Uh, and with that, Bill, why don't we start? Uh, let's start actually with the with the telling of the story. Um, I was saying to you just before we started this that I've seen sometimes you get interviewed and the interviewer tells the story <laughs> of notice because it's so compelling. Uh, why don't I leave that to you? Okay, well, well, gr great to be here, James. Um, good to see you and I'm glad to be involved in this um, uh, in your thinking. Um, so, so my story is a is a is a dramatic and strange story. Um, uh, you can hear my American accent, I'm originally from America, but I come from an unusual family background. Um, my grandfather um, was an American communist. Um, he um, became head of the American Communist Party, ran for president on the communist ticket in 1936-1940, um, was eventually kicked out of the Communist Party and then persecuted viciously during the McCarthy era. And so um, in my teenage rebellion, um, to rebel from my family of communists, I became a capitalist. I went to Stanford Business School and I graduated business school in 1989, which was the year the Berlin Wall came down. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, um, uh, what am I gonna do after business school? And I thought, well, if my grandfather was the biggest communist in America and the Berlin Wall has come down, I'm gonna try to become the biggest capitalist in Russia. So I moved out to Russia. Um, I set up an investment fund, it's called the Hermitage Fund, and it grows from zero to becoming the largest investment fund in the country. And um, in the process of, of investing, I discover that all the companies that I'm investing in are effectively being ripped off by oligarchs, the Russian oligarchs we all know now. And um, I started to challenge the oligarchs by researching how they did the corruption um, and then sharing that research with the international media. And um, what uh, years are this, uh, Bill? What years are we in now? 
so so we're, we I start I start doing this anti-corruption work um, around 1999, right. and this is just at the time that that uh, Vladimir Putin had had come to power, and we have this. Um, I've never met Putin and, and um, never spoken to him, but we had this strange alignment of interests where um, the oligarchs were stealing money from me at the same time as they were stealing power from him. And so as I was uh, sort of exposing the, the crimes and, and scams of these oligarchs, um, Putin, there's this expression that your enemy's enemy is your friend. Yeah. And so Putin started to use my exposés um, as a pretext to go after some of his enemies which for, for, for a brief period of time was very helpful to me because I was exposing theft at big Russian companies. The oligarchs were doing the stealing. Putin would go after the oligarchs and then some of the stealing would stop and the share prices would go up. And so for a while I had this perfect life where I was doing good and making a lot of money for my clients and myself at the same time. So this went on for, for about four years until one day Putin decided he wanted to win his war with the oligarchs. And he did so by arresting the richest oligarch in the country, a man named Mikhail Hordakovsky, the owner of an oil company called Yukos. Um, he has him arrested off of his private jet in Siberia, brought back to Moscow, um, put on trial. And in Russia, when you're on trial, you sit in a cage. And so he allowed the television cameras to come in and film the richest man in Russia sitting in a cage. And so if you were like the 17th richest man in Russia and you saw the richest guy sitting in a cage, well, that was the last thing you wanted to be doing yourself. And so one by one by one, the oligarchs, um, after Hordakovsky was convicted and sentenced to 10 years, went to Putin and said, Vladimir, what do we have to do to make sure we don't sit in the cage? And his reaction was 50%. Not 50% not for the Russian government or 50% for the presidential administration of Russia, but 50% for Vladimir Putin. And that was the moment that Vladimir Putin became the richest man in the world. And that was the moment that all of my... Yep. I, I just, we, we've got, fortunately, we've got time, so I want to make sure we get every bit of this. Yep. So, so how can you say that with confidence? And the reason I ask it is that as a journalist, that's always been, you know, if you like, the, you know, until this pandemic, the biggest story in the world. The, 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 the richest man in the world is actually the president of Russia, and, and no one can trace it and no one can identify his wealth. So when you assert 50% of the money from these oligarchs was being handed over to Vladimir Putin, how, how can you assert that with any sort of contact, uh, confidence or even evidence? Well, so, so, so what happens over time is that not, Russia is not like a totally secure information place as far as all these dirty deals go. And so as time has gone on, various, various bits of information have leaked out. People have been, you know, sort of betrayed him or, or fled from him or uh, exposed him. And so, for example, um, I, you know, we, we can't say in the aggregate um, this whole 50% thing because we can't measure every single oligarch and, and all of Putin's money, but we can, we can certainly find anecdotes um, where this has happened. And so, for example, there, there's this um, uh, villa or chateau or castle, whatever you want to call it, on the Black Sea, which cost a billion dollars to build. And um, the person um, who was in charge of building it, uh, um, and I should say it cost a billion dollars to build and it belongs to Vladimir Putin. And the person in charge of building it um, uh, somehow fell out with Putin and, and the administration and fled with all of his records. And what his records show is that a bunch of oligarchs contributed uh, hundreds of millions of dollars each to the purchase of this house. And that's just one example. Right. Um, there, there's, there's uh, other examples. Uh, uh, if you just read the, for example, the um, uh, U.S. Treasury website, um, when they were imposing sanctions on Russia, uh, they, they declared a certain group of people that the U.S. government and the CIA and all the um, information that they've gathered were effectively Putin's bankers. There's a, they're, they're on the sanctions list. They were put on there um, in uh, early uh, 2019. And um, again, the U.S. Treasury says these people are, are trustees for Vladimir Putin. Or if you want to just come, come with a, even a more mundane example, is just to um, uh, uh, look at his watch collection. <laughs> um, his, his, so he, he's on an official salary of something like $150,000 a year. But if you just, just look at the um, photographs of what watches he's wearing on, on different days, he has watches that are worth millions of dollars. And, and so... 
one can sort of take a bunch of different pieces of the puzzle and you'll never be able to get the full puzzle because it's in their, their intention not to get you that full puzzle. But you can take pieces of the puzzle and put them together um, and, and be able to extrapolate from those pieces of the puzzle that Vladimir Putin is this unbelievably rich crook um, who is also the head of state. So, so uh, and then takes back, sorry, because I uh, interrupted. Khodorkovsky's I trial, the, the oligarchs begin to, if you like, pivot towards Putin. And, yep. and, and, and where's Hermitage at that stage? What, what are you doing when that change happens? Well, so, so I, I, I'm not reading the tea leaves. Um, uh, and, and the reason I'm not reading the tea leaves is that if I had been trying to read the tea leaves from the very get-go when I went to Russia, I would have never gone there in the first place. In a certain sense, you have to like sand off your risk sensors in order to go to Russia. And so I just carried on doing what, exactly what I was doing, which was exposing the oligarchs. Right. But in, instead of exposing the oligarchs uh, who are enemies of Putin, I was now exposing the oligarchs who are business partners with Putin. And that's an entirely different story. And so they had to figure out what to do with me. And um, in November of 2005, as I was flying back to Moscow after having lived there for 10 years, at that point, I was the largest foreign investor in Russia, I had four and a half billion dollars invested in the Russian stock market. Um, I was stopped at Sheremetyevo Airport. I was going through the VIP lounge. I was arrested by four heavily armed border guards. I was put into the, the detention center of the airport. I was held there for 15 hours. And then I was put on a Aeroflot flight back to London and deported out of Russia, which by the way, was the biggest relief of my life. The fact that I wasn't being sent to Siberia, but I was being sent back to London, biggest relief of my life. So I was deported from Russia. I was subsequently declared a threat to national security of Russia. And at this point I had a, I had a real, um, problem, which is that um, I still had all my people in Russia. I had, I had about, a, 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 about 15 employees and their dependents, and we had all of our money invested in Russia. And I said to myself, um, the Russians turn on you. They don't tend to do so mildly. They tend to do so with extreme prejudice. Mm. And so it was really uh, crucial that, that I said, well, where else can they get me? And I thought, well, they can go after my people and they go after my assets. And so I evacuated my staff. And then once we got them safe and their families to London, um, we quietly and quickly liquidated all of our assets in Russia. And we got everything out. Everything was, we got everything out without them arresting anybody or seizing the assets. And at that point, I, I thought I was done with Russia. Um, turns out that they were just getting started with me. Uh, 18 months after I was expelled from Russia, uh, 25 police officers raided my office in Moscow. And that was the one thing I kept in, in Moscow was, was an office that I prepaid for and there was a secretary there. They raided the office in Moscow and then 25 more officers raided the office of an American law firm that I used um, to administer our investment holding companies, which at this point were now empty. Mm -hmm. The police were specifically looking for the stamps, seals, and certificates for our investment holding companies, the sort of foundation documents which they found at the law firm. The police seized those documents. And the next thing we know, we no longer own our companies. Those companies using the documents seized by the police have been fraudulently re-registered into the name of a man who had been convicted of manslaughter and let out of jail early by the police, presumably to put his name on these documents. Right. So at, at, at this point, I'm terrified, not for economic reasons, all our money was safe out of Russia, but I'm terrified for legal reasons, that if the police were working with uh, murderers and, and stealing, uh, drumming up false cases and stealing stuff, one day I'll be traveling through some airport somewhere and I'll be arrested and sent off to Siberia. And so I, I, I needed to get legal help. And I hired the smartest lawyer I knew in Russia, a young man named Sergei Magnitsky. I asked Sergei uh, to investigate figure out what they were trying to do with all this stealing of our companies, because there was nothing in the companies, um, and then to help me stop what it is, whatever it is they were trying to do. Yeah. So, so Sergey goes, he investigates, and he figures out what they were trying to do. And, ju and just, to, just to forgive me at this stage, just, just describe Sergey for a moment. So Sergey was 35 years old. He worked for an American law firm. Um, uh, and he was one of these guys, he, he, was, he was one of these people who could do 10 things 
in the time that it took another lawyer to do one. He could literally run circles around everybody. And so he was just a, a true sort of confident genius when it came to legal matters. <clears throat> and, um, and, he was, and, and he was able to um, figure out a, a very complicated fraud. And he came back to me with the, with the results. And he mm -hmm. said there, there were two parts of this fraud. The first part was that these police and these crooks all wanted to, they wanted to steal all of my assets. But thankfully, we didn't have any assets in Russia anymore because we had taken them all out. He said, but Sergei said there was a second part of the scam. Mm -hmm. and, and the second part of the scam was truly ingenious, which was that when I had been kicked out of Russia a year before, after I was kicked out, we liquidated all of our holdings. Mm -hmm. And when we liquidated all of our holdings, we, had a, we declared a profit. We had a profit of a billion dollars. And on that profit of a billion dollars, we paid to the Russian government $230 million of capital gains tax. And what Sergei had figured out was that the people who stole our companies went back to the tax authorities and they said there was a mistake made in the previous year's tax filing. These companies didn't earn a billion dollars, they earned zero. And they came up with a clever way of explaining, or complicated way of explaining that. Um, and, 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 and they said, as a result, because, we've earned, because these companies have earned zero, the taxes were paid in error. The $230 million of taxes that we paid was paid in error. And they wanted it back. And so they wanted it back. So, so they applied for a $230 million illegal tax refund, which I should point out was the largest tax refund in the history of Russia. They applied hmm. for it on the 23rd of December, 2007, two days before Christmas. And it was approved and paid out the next oh day. My oh my God. I mean, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. Un, un, unbelievable. And so, and so Magnitsky identifies all of this, the whole, the whole, and then what happens? So at, so at this point, we, Sergey and I get together and we say that this must be a rogue operation because Vladimir Putin is a patriot. He would never allow his own officials. And this is not our money. This, this was the Russian government's money that was being stolen. Mm -hmm. And Putin, we thought Putin would never allow his officials to steal his money. And so we thought if we just bring this to the attention of the highest levels of law enforcement and, and the top people in Russia, then, then uh, the good guys would get the bad guys and that would be the end of the story. So we, okay. we file criminal complaints to every different law enforcement agency. I go to the newspapers, TV, radio. And then Sergei goes to the Russian State Investigative Committee, which is their version of the FBI. And he gives sworn testimony against the police officers who conducted the raid to seize the documents that were used in the fraud. Um, and then we, we sit back and we wait for the good guys to get the bad guys. Well, it turns out that in Vladimir Putin's government, there are no good guys. Hmm. About five weeks after, this, after Sergei testified against these police officers, the same officers he testified against came to his home on the 24th of November, 2008. Hmm. They arrested him. They put him in pretrial detention. And then, then he was then tortured to get him to withdraw his testimony. Uh, they took, put him in cells with 14 inmates and eight beds and left lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. Uh, they put him in cells with no heat and no window panes in December in Moscow, so he nearly froze to death. Uh, they put him in cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They moved him from cell to cell to cell in the middle of the night. And the purpose of all this was to get him to withdraw his testimony against these corrupt police officers. And they wanted to get him to sign a false confession to say that he stole the $230 million and he did it on my instruction. And Sergei was a man of incredible principle and integrity. And for him, the idea of perjuring himself and bearing false witness was more awful than the physical pain they were subjecting him to. And he refused. Hmm. And so as a result, um, uh, uh, they, they, um, uh, they moved him uh, uh, from prison to prison. And, 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 and then and the, the, um, and, and the torture started to get increased and increased. And at, at a certain point, uh, Sergei got ill. And he, um, he lost about 20 kilos. He developed terrible pains in his stomach. And he was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones and needing an operation, which was scheduled for the 1st of August, 2009. Right before the operation, they again came to him. Uh, they again um, asked him to, to sign this false confession. Again, he refused. 
And um, in retaliation, they then, they then move, moved him to a maximum security prison called Butyrka, which mm -hmm. is considered to be one of the most awful prisons in Russia. And most significantly for Sergei, there was no proper medical facilities at Butyrka. And at Butyrka, his health completely broke down. He went into a terrible downward spiral. He was in constant agonizing, uh, ear piercing pain from untreated pancreatitis. He and his lawyers wrote 20 different formal requests for medical attention to every different branch of the criminal justice system. Every one of their requests was either ignored or denied in writing. And on the night of November 16, 2009, Sergei Magnitsky went into critical condition. Hmm. On that night, the, the, the Butyrka authorities didn't want to have responsibility for him anymore. They put him in an ambulance and sent him to a different prison that had a medical wing. But when he arrived at this other prison, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell, they chained him to a bed, and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat him until he died. That was November 16th, 2009, about 10 and a half years ago. Sergei Magnitsky was 37 years old. He left a wife and two children. Well, thank, thank you for, for telling it. And I, and I know that normally and often when people have written books, you, you, you sort of, you run bar, past the story and you get to talking about the big themes or the big ideas, but it's obviously in the detail of the story that you learn so much about the way Russia works and you also remember Sergei Magnitsky. Um, I'm actually going to, if I might, bring in, uh, if I can, bring in um, Jill Monroe, either I can ask, uh, question right better still I'll actually get her to but I suppose the stranger there, there you are Jill um why don't you ask the question that you, that you put in the in the chat um and put it to Bill um well thanks for telling your story again Bill I read Red Notice and I think the thing that really struck me when I was reading it um was that I was reading it in the same way I would I would read a sort of thriller on the beach or, or watch a kind of movie and of course the shocking thing is that it's all too real and it was your life and it was Sergei's real life and I wondered really how how you as an individual kind of cope in that situation where you suddenly realize that that life has taken a turn that is no longer kind of going to work and doing something that many people do being a fund manager or whatever and suddenly being in this hugely dramatic and frightening situation. How did you cope with that? Um, well, you know, it's interesting because um, uh, if anyone had ever told me this was what my life would be like, I would have never gone to Russia in the first place. Um, but everything that happened as it was happening was happening incrementally. And, and it's sort of like that, that sort of um, anecdote about the frog and you put it in the boiling water. Um, in, in the, and you just kind of keep getting used to the heat being turned up and, and turned up. And so I kind of, I, 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 it was just sort of, everything was very incremental. And so I never really had a, a chance to sort of, um, sort of stop, stop the process at any point. It was all just sort of kept on going and, and kept on going. And so um, uh, in, in a certain way, you just kind of put your feelings aside and, and deal with the crisis as it's happening. And, and um, I, I wouldn't say that, that um, uh, at every moment, I coped perfectly. It was, you know, there were some moments of absolute abject, you know, hysteria, terror, or whatever. I mean, the moment, the day after Sergei, when I learned, after Sergei died, I, I learned about it in the morning of, of uh, November 17th, and it was just the most heartbreaking, life-changing thing I could have ever heard. I mean, I was hyperventilating. I was, I, I can't, couldn't, can't even describe to you the amount of horror of having a person who worked for you tortured to death um, and to know that that he'd still be alive if he hadn't worked for you and, and, and for me that was I mean you know I guess now after, after he's dead and and now that I'm I, I've devoted my life to getting justice for him in a certain way my, my campaign for justice and every everything I do to get justice for him um, is part of my coping mechanism and, and so sorry go ahead Jill I'd just say thank you for that answer. It's really interesting to, to hear you say that. And because, Bill, I, I tell you what I'd like to do. I'm, I think, you know, there's also then a whole chapter, a decade, in fact, of life, which is trying to 
get governments to respond to the murder of uh, Sergei Magnitsky and respond to Russia. But before we go there, can you talk a little bit, there are lots of, there are lots of good questions about the, the character and nature of Putin's government that I suppose are worth thinking about now. Be, beyond, beyond your case, um, my colleague Tessa Murray you know, asked this good question, which is, is it really that there are no good guys, only bad guys? Surely there are degrees. What's the, what's the nature of that, of that team around Vladimir Putin, around the nature of the people who work as officials in the government? How have you come to understand uh, Russia itself and the culture of Russian government? Well, um, the best thing I could compare it to is, is the mafia. So um, um, if you're a minister in the Russian government, um, it's like joining you know, the Sopranos, you know, the Soprano family in New Jersey. You, know, you have to be a made man. You've got to commit a crime in order to be part of their group. And so um, there, there, it's, it's, a, it's true that, that you cannot be a good guy in Putin's government, because if you are, um, you're going against the grain of everything that they stand for. It's a criminal organization. And so um, uh, anybody who tries to be good um, either gets you know, put in jail, killed, or whatever, and anyone who uh, adapts to their system of, of brutality and, and criminality gets rewarded and gets fa fabulously rich. And so the incentives are completely turned on their head for what it takes to be in the Russian government. And because of that, um, I mean, there are people that might have been good guys when they were teenagers or in college. I'm, and I've even encountered a few of these people when I was in Russia who were sort of like westernized. Maybe they went to like university, different univers Western universities and like spoke our language and uh, and seem to have our values, and then you know stick them for ten or fifteen years in Putin's government, and they come out as you know um, ma made men in the mafia, and and um, that that's sort of the only option for these people. And so it really isn't. Uh, I, I hate to say it, and and it's totally different than any other place. But um, there there really genuinely are no good people in the Russian government. I'm, I'm going to bring. Tessa Mari actually had her hand up to, to make the point. Tessa, I'm going to bring you in. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks, Bill, for doing this on a Monday night. It's, it's brilliant. I mean, I, I, was, I suppose that I had um, a slightly difficult question for you, which is, you know, ten and a half years on, with Putin sort of hiding in plain sight and, and apparently no appetite to, to challenge him, take him out, take him down, what's going to happen? They're just going to run out of money and opportunities to skim the state? What, where do we go from here? Well, we're, we're in a really um, difficult crossroads. R Russia's, Putin is in a very difficult crossroads right now because he's created such a, a hostile, toxic um, business environment in Russia over the 20 years that he's ruled that they haven't been able to diversify their economy. There, there's no way that any normal person would take any, if, if you're like an entrepreneur that you can make great things happen, it would be really a dumb idea to set up a business in Russia because if the business succeeds, someone will try to steal it from you and will succeed in stealing from you. Um, and so therefore, why would you, they have no incentive to have a business in Russia. So anybody who's got any good <clears throat> skills leaves the country. <clears throat> and as a result of that, you end up having <clears throat> the only companies that, that remain as a major part of the economy are the state owned and large oil and gas companies and, and metals and mining, com mining companies. And as a result of that, like at this point, I think 75% of Russia's government budget revenues come from natural resources. And, and because of that, you know, we're, we're in, a, in a world right now where oil prices have gone you know, mm. below zero in some cases. And because of that, Russia is financially um, crippled. Now, in, in theory, they have savings for a rainy day. They've saved money and they, they built up reserves. But the, when oil prices are as low as they are, they're going to burn through all those reserves very quickly. And in theory, Russia could borrow money because they, they don't have that much borrowing compared to other countries because they defaulted on their debt back in 1998. However, <clears throat> the reality is that if Russia burn, has oil prices at these levels, burn through, burns through all their reserves, they're not going to have much money left. And so you have a, you have a country which is fundamentally um, uh, economically hugely vulnerable unless oil prices rise again, which I don't believe they will. 
And that puts Putin in a very difficult position because it's one thing to be a dictator um, in, a, um, in a supposed de democracy, which Russia isn't, but they, they pretend to be, um, if things are going well. But if you're a dictator in a country where things aren't going well and people are getting poor and people are hungry, anything could happen. And so Putin, in his own best case scenario, would like to be uh, president for life. He'd like to die a natural death at, at a very old age in office. Um, and that's his plan. But it may not work out that way for him. And so I think he's really vulnerable right now to, um, to, the, to the winds of fortune and the winds of, of, of economics and, and this uh, COVID situation, um, particularly not, not, not because of the domestic uh, death rate but, or, the de or sickness, but because of the oil price um, right. really puts him in a precarious spot and it puts him in, in a place where he doesn't know what's going to happen and nor do we know what's going to happen. Can we, Bill, can we, can we come back to that uh, in a moment? Um, I, I wanted to bring in t uh, Tiffany Elliott, uh, not least because the conversation in the chat has been absolutely fascinating and her interest in Russia is obviously um, widespread. Hello, Tiffany. Why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, wait, it's good to have you. Thank you. Um, I've been interested in Russia and the culture for years. I was five when the Berlin Wall fell. I just did back there myself. Uh, I watched Anastasia when I was about 13, just fell in love with it. Um, I was in college when the Yurko guy, I think is what it is, was, um, was imprisoned and I had a professor named Chris Damaski at the University of Washington talked about Glasnost and Vistorkia. And it was just, it's always kind of intrigued me. Um, my question has to do with mostly um, uh, Putin's Russia and um, Trump's uh, United States, um, especially in regards to the uh, Flynn pardon, um, the Michael Flynn pardon, and really the connection between um, the McKinsey Act, I'm sorry for the butchering of the name, to uh, the infamous, or if you will, Trump Tower meeting, which I thought was a very interesting connection when I was reading the, um, the Mueller report, actually, having read, read, notice before that. Um, do you think, uh, what are the similarities, what are the differences, uh, do you think as, uh, as the United States is a nation um, that we are past the point of no return as it seemingly is with Putin's Russia? Well, um, uh, I... oh, sorry about that. Well, I, I, I put my thing on do not disturb. I don't know how, how that happened, but um, let, okay. me, let me just, uh, um, anyways, can, uh, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we got you fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, that's a good question, um, but uh, and, and a lot of people are saying, well, you know, you, the U.S. is you know, the rule of law is 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 been thrown out the window, and and and, and you know, America is becoming a totalitarian state, and so on. But from my vantage point, having seen Russia and seeing it now every day, and seeing it all the time, um, it, it's it's incomparable. Um, the two countries. I mean, uh, the United States has has really um, wh whether whether you know whether there's whether there's pressure on the institutions. The institutions of the United States are extremely robust. I mean, every day um, uh, we read news reports criticizing the president and the administration in every newspaper in the country. You couldn't do that in Russia. The, mm -hmm. All those newspapers will be shut down. Their their owners will be put in prison. Um, you hear. Um, uh, opposition politicians um, uh, criticizing the government. Um, in, in Russia, those people will be arrested and killed, perhaps, like Boris Nemtsov was. Um, every day you have the courts um, uh, demanding things, stopping things, etc. That would never happen in Russia. And so uh, I, I'm actually, um, I, I don't think you can ruin America in four years, no matter what anyone tries to do, or even eight years. I think that, that the, the institutions of the United States will survive um, any of these things, and they were designed to survive these things. And on the, around, on the margins, it's, it's, you can see things happening which are very um, unappetizing, but that doesn't mean that the entire uh, structures have been ruined. And, and I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic that, that America will survive any, any attempts to ruin these institutions. Um, and, 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 and I may sound like an optimist, but having seen how, how bad it can be, I don't see, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the, all the institutions are currently working at, at, at the moment. Um, um, Bill, I'm, 
Uh, just to pick up though on Tiffany's point, before we got on, you were mentioning that you're working now on a new book and a book that takes takes you beyond the killing of Sergei Magnitsky, the, the Magnitsky Act in the US, and I suppose up something close to the present day and into the US, I suppose. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I don't want to give away too much just because um, uh, I'm, I'm still in the process of writing it, but basically the, um, I'm, I'm writing a second book. It's called Freezing Order. Mm. And Freezing Order um, uh, follows our investigation into the money laundering, uh, the $230 million that Sergei Magnitsky was killed over <clears throat> and where that money went and who, the, who got that money and what they did to try to keep that money. And it leads us right into Trump Tower where um, one of the recipients of that money, um, a Russian uh, individual named Denis Kotsiv, uh, sends his lawyer, a woman named Natalia Veselnitskaya, who also <clears throat> is bringing in messages from the Kremlin. And she goes into Trump Tower to meet Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort before Trump was elected <clears throat> um, with a specific ask which is that if Trump gets elected, will he repeal the Magnitsky Act? Right. And, um, uh, and it's sort of a, uh, it's, a, it's another thriller which will bring us right up to date. And um, uh, for anyone who, uh, who has read my first book, um, you won't be disappointed with the second. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, that's very, that's, that's unusually coy of you, but yes, all right. Can we, can we talk a little bit about um, the nature of the Russian state. I, I want to talk about it in a moment as regards uh, as regards you and the you know the threats that were made to you, the way in which you've been portrayed in the media, and get a sense of what what your critics say of you. What what did you what what have you learned about the experience? Picking up on Jill's point, you know there have been a number of threats to you personally, but also there are a run of reputational questions that where people ask, well, you know, how good is this guy really? How has he spent his money? What is the, you know, what, what, what's the nature of his identity and his interests? T tell us a little bit about how you've been portrayed and how you handle that portrayal. So the, so the Russian, um, so ever since the Magnitsky Act was passed and the Magnitsky Act was named after Sergei Magnitsky. It's a piece of legislation that started in the United States, which imposes visa sanctions and asset freezes on Russian human rights violators and kleptocrats. And Vladimir Putin was so angry with me for doing this <clears throat> that he banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families and then made it his single largest foreign policy priority to repeal the Magnitsky Act. And he also wanted to destroy me. And since the Magnitsky Act was passed, I've been threatened with death on multiple occasions. I've been threatened with illegal rendition back to Russia. Uh, Russia has issued eight Interpol um, <clears throat> arrest warrants to have me arrested. I was actually arrested in Madrid, Spain, uh, two summers ago on an Interpol warrant. They tried having me extradited from the UK. Um, they've sentenced me um, to two different um, convictions, um, nine years each for 18 years in total in absentia in Russia. Um, they've opened up more criminal cases against me for everything from espionage to murder, to fraud, to tax evasion. Um, and they've sued me in multiple courts around the world for libel, for illegal bankruptcy, for every, anything they can think of. Um, and they've employed um, millions and millions of dollars of money towards PR firms to try to destroy my credibility and my reputation so I can't get more Magnitsky acts passed around the world. Um, that, and, that's and, about, that, about that last bit, Bill, particularly, because there are people who, the, the, you know, the, st the story is so far from our daily lives, but also in so many ways, as people say, incredible. And some people stop and say it is incredible. They, they, like, how did this guy get his money out? Why is it that he got to know the details of the, the, the torture that Magnitsky suffered? It doesn't make sense that, and that, that someone like you can stand up and keep on saying the things that you're saying. You know, it suggests, a, it, it doesn't, it, to some people it doesn't make sense. It suggests either that you're exaggerating or that the Putin government is incompetent. Well, so, so you have to understand that the Russians, um, when they do things, um, they're very sloppy about doing them, uh, but at the same time, they document everything. And so, we have documentary evidence that Sergei Magnitsky was beaten by eight riot guards 
with rubber batons on the last night of his life. The, 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 a bunch of eight rag guards signed the protocol saying they beat him. Um, we have documentary evidence saying that he suffered cerebral cranial injuries. We have, we have photographs of his bruised, battered body. Um, and so, and these all come from the Russians. But I mean, so it's like the Gestapo, they, they, they documented everything and they just weren't smart enough to like cover it up. And, and even in, within their own system, they, they concluded that Sergei Magnitsky was murdered. Even, I mean, and, and then, I mean, President Medvedev had his own president's Human Rights Council um, come to this conclusion. And, and still, um, they, 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 they change the story whenever they want because that's kind of what the Russians do. You know, uh, MH17 gets shot down and they say the Ukrainians did it. They get caught cheating in the Olympics and they say, oh, that, that's just fake news. The, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Russians, they're, 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 they have no ability, they just lie and get caught constantly, constantly. The guys who, who did the, the, the poisoning in Salisbury were there to see the cathedral. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's comical. And then, well, but, and, then, and then tell us, because, you know, I, I noticed some people in the chat then saying, this doesn't make, there's a, there's a different element that doesn't make sense. Not, not, a, not just the, the people who question you, Bill, but the people who sort of question the nature of Russian power in the world and who are mystified by it. And they're mystified, I suppose, by, one, the, the understanding of the scale of Russia's military power. Is that overestimated? And two, by the point that you make, the, the, the apparent vulnerability of the Russian economy, particularly to things like oil prices, suggests that Russia is overestimated and yet still wields a level of influence and power in the world that, that frankly, you know, many other countries don't. So, so why do you think that is? Do you think the, the, the West or the world is just playing Putin wrong? Yeah. I think that, so, so, um, just, so, so let's just quantify things for a second. So uh, the Russian economy is about the same size as the economy of the state of New York. Um, the Russian military budget is about the same size as Britain's military budget. And I can say that about 80% of the Russian military budget is stolen through graft and fraud. And so, it, it, so you, you don't have an economic superpower you don't have a military superpower. Yes, they have nuclear weapons, um, but anything short of nuclear war, they're, they're completely and absolutely weak. And so what, what, do, they, what, what do they do in a situation like that? And, and Putin has this very, very strong desire to be seen as a big guy on the world stage. And so if you can't do it through real power means, all you can do really is do it through asymmetric power means. What, is that? what does asymmetric mean? It means that, that you send in little green men to invade Crimea. Um, it means that you um, uh, send out assassination squads around the world and, and, and claim that, that they were just tourists. It means that you hack um, uh, political parties in the West um, from unknown computers that you, that you can then say wasn't me. And so uh, effectively what Vladimir Putin has done is he's become sort of this um, a player in the world by, by through, through asymmetric, um, uh, uh, non sort of traditional means. It's kind of like if, if, you want, if, if you're like a crazy guy in your neighborhood and maybe you don't have guns or anything, but you just have a knife and you go around you know, uh, threatening mm -hmm. everyone with your knife, um, you'll become a powerful guy in your neighborhood. But that's what Putin has done well, in the world. He's threatening well, people well, with, you know, in that spirit, Bill, can I, can I bring in Candida Watson? Because right early on, uh, she asked a question which I thought was, 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 was uh, quite interesting. It was about the sort of scale of Putin's uh, ambition or, if you like, fearlessness. I don't know whether, Candida, you're still there. And if so, I can... Yeah, I am, James. Yeah, hello. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wondered whether Putin has boxed himself into a corner now where he dare not leave power. He can't really nominate a successor. He probably would like to go to his palace on the Black Sea and while away his time playing, doing karate and the like. But if he relaxes his grip, he would be vulnerable to the behavior that he has inflicted on others. What's your view on that? So, so you're absolutely right. So, for, for, so he's stolen so much money. He's killed so many people. He's imprisoned and taken hostage so many people. Um, that there's no way, 
um, and, and, oh, and one more important thing, none of the money is in, is in, is in his own name. So the money is, so there's no document that says Vladimir Putin um, has got a, a bank account with a billion dollars here or a billion dollars there. Because if that, if that document existed, that document could be used um, to blackmail him and put pressure on him. And he, he understands blackmail and pressure better than anyone as a former KGB officer. And so all the money is held in the name of trustees, of oligarch trustees and, and other trustees, people he trusts. And so there's no written agreement anywhere. And so if he's not in power, he doesn't actually end up getting any of that money because nobody's, there's no honor among thieves. They're not gonna give him that money. And worse than that, if he's not, no longer in power, all the enemies he's created, um, he'll end up in jail. And if he ends up in jail, then he'll probably end up far worse. And so he understands that. And, and this is nothing, this is not some great insight. This is what happens all the time in these brutal parts of the world, all, all over the former Soviet Union. You know, nobody ever, there's no peaceful transition where, where the former president or prime minister um, gets to enjoy a quiet life afterwards. And so Putin understands this very clearly, and he understands that there's no way that he could ever, and I, he probably would love to, to retire um, to his billion dollar villa or, or any of the other $50 billion villas that are out there for him. But he, he can't do that because he understands that his life is in danger, his life is in jeopardy and his money is in jeopardy and everything is in jeopardy for doing that. And so he has to come up with a, a plausible way in which he can remain president for life. And, and he's more or less proposed that. They wanna change the constitution so he can be president for life. They were about to go and, and have a uh, uh, sort of uh, referendum on this subject right when this um, uh, coronavirus hit. And so they postponed it. But I have no doubt that there will be a referendum. It probably won't be a, a fair referendum. And, um, and it, it will overwhelmingly support his, his, upper, his objective of being president for life. And he'll be president for life. Bill, can I, can I, can I um, try and do a sort of couple of things in the last time that's remaining? One is I just want to follow up on a the point you're making about the nature of Russian power, particularly military power, and I don't know whether I can bring in Kriti Kapila, because there was an interesting point, or there's an interesting debate going on in the chat as you're speaking about, if you like, conventional power, tanks and armies, etc. And Kriti, your point, which is about new forms of warfare. Do you want to do you want to make the point that you were making in the chat to Bill and just sort of ex explain what your thinking is? So I was just wondering. Thanks, James. Uh, this is all very interesting. I was just wondering, you know, um, I was just saying that actually uh, warfare as one has imagined it has actually shifted uh, when Russia is, uh, when you look at Russia, not what it's doing domestically, but, uh, but globally in that there are new forms of warfare which don't even actually look confrontational because the, the networks of corruption are global in which Russia is a very key player. And, uh, and that, you know, uh, Russia is now dominating forms of, uh, or has acquired forms of domination that don't look like traditional forms, such mm -hmm. as, you know, cyber hacking and managing everybody else's elections, etc. So that was the point I was trying to raise in the chat. Well, it's, 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 it's a very important point. So, um, you know, it costs tens of billions of dollars to um, keep and and maintain uh, a traditional military um, readyment, um, you know, tanks and ships and planes and so on. But it, it only costs like tens of millions of dollars to do these hacking campaigns that have been so unbelievably effective. And I'm not just talking about the United States. So yes, Russia hacked the U.S. election. That's a matter of fact, and it's been absolutely confirmed by every. U.S. intelligence agency, but they also hacked um, the uh, Macron's emails before the French election. Um, they hacked the German parliament. They've hacked. They 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 they've been highly effective at hacking almost every political organization and using that information um, in ways that has unbelievable um, uh, a ripple effect um, through on on countries and politics and policy, and it's so inexpensive. It's so, it's so asymmetric, so inexpensive compared to the conventional warfare. And so Russia doesn't have to be a rich country. It doesn't have to be, um, uh, have the biggest military in order to have this unbelievably powerful effect. 
And of course, they're not afraid to use this information in, in, in ways that, you know, I'm sure that other countries probably have similar hacking capabilities, but just aren't so brazen about using the information. But Russia uses it to its maximum possible advantage without any, any fear of what the consequences will be afterwards. But, 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 Bill, Bill, it, so on that note, could you take us to where we are right now? In fact, I was going to see if I could bring in Rebecca Felton because she made this point about the use of information, particularly in the context of uh, COVID. There you are, Rebecca. Why, why don't you make the point to, to Bill? Yeah. Hi, thank you, James. Um, and thank you, Bill. This is really fascinating. Um, I guess my reflection was that um, as we find ourselves in the, the COVID infodemic um, and more broadly in an age of disinformation and, and propaganda that I think we're, we're really only at the tip of and um, certainly since 2016 having proven evidence of the disruption that it causes to our own democratic functions but more widely in, in sort of a global surge in um, hateful extremism and, and terrorist action as well. Um, obviously Russia is really the, the sort of blueprint of information warfare and we do exist very much in the shadow of this sort of cold war uh, legacy and, and sort of to some degree paranoia and it's very difficult um, to really penetrate from the from the outside view the sort of totemic nature of the control that um, mm. Putin really yields um, or oh, sorry wields over his own people and and to what degree that itself is a fabrication and I think also learning what we are about our own susceptibility to um, to disinformation, what are the lessons that we can be learning um, and, and should be learning very quickly um, to help us both um, unravel this uh, sort of very effective smokescreen that, that he creates, um, but also to learn about our own vulnerabilities. Well, part, part of the problem that we have in the West is that we are open societies, we are democracies, and everybody is entitled to their view. And so you end up in this situation where, um, uh, you know, um, he, and he's a closed society. You know, Putin has created a closed society where but they've just passed a law that, that anyone who spreads, quote, disinformation about um, coronavirus um, will go to jail. And so um, uh, we're, we're sort of um, in this totally uneven playing field where, He's taking complete advantage of the fact that we have these open societies, and 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 um, and, and so, you know, how how do we deal with? You know, how do we if we have freedom of speech and freedom of belief? How do we how do we then um, apply that when Russia then feeds in a bunch of uh, misinformation or false information, or 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 even finances certain extremist groups? Um, who have their own agendas, but but you know are are then are then empowered by Russia um, to create chaos, and so we really have a, a huge vulnerability based on on the fact that we are open societies, and 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 that's I don't think anyone has come up with a plan for for how to deal with that because the only real plan is to close some of our freedoms, and we don't want to do that because by doing that we've we've effectively become like him, and so it, it's. It's really a, a, a dilemma, which, which has, nobody has, has figured out even the beginning of an answer to. Can, can I ask you, can I ask you just, we, th thank you, Rebecca, because I, want, I wanted to, as we, as we come into the last five minutes, just pick up on a couple of things. Um, one of them, Bill, is to pick up on the point you made right at the beginning about, um, you know, coming from this communist tradition and then deciding to embrace capitalism. And I wonder now whether or not, more broadly, looking away from Russia, but the experience of looking at uh, what happened in Russia and the interests at play when you, when you discover corruption, whether that's made you think differently about capitalism itself and its, and its vulnerability to corruption. Well, so, so one of the things, so I, I spent um, you know, 10 years living in Russia dealing with all this terrible criminality and corruption there. Um, and then after the Magnitsky murder, um, I spent 10 years in, in dealing with um, how that money from that crime and other monies from other crimes have gone to corrupt the West. 
And the Russians wouldn't be able to um, get away with all this criminality if they didn't have the enablers from the West um, who are helping them hide their money, um, helping them uh, keep their families safe, and helping them launder their reputation, and even using um, Western law enforcement, Western courts to go chasing after their enemies. Mm. And so what, what I've discovered is, is that um, uh, in addition to the open society questions that we just talked about a second ago, um, we also have these uh, um, a, a large number of people in London and New York and Paris and other places um, who are ready to sell their principles for money, and and you have and 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 they they are oftentimes people who are well connected politically, and so um, uh, we have a real problem with with how the West has been how he, how effectively Vladimir Putin has exported his corruption not just. I mean, it doesn't just exist in Russia, but it exists in the West. And, and um, that's something which, in a certain way, I find even more upsetting, and more angering than, than even the, what the Russians have done. I mean, the, I, kind of, I kind of view what the Russians as, as all being brought up in this brutal jungle where, the, where like nobody ever had a chance to, to like sort of develop into sort of honest, nice people because of the brutality, like the incentives are just so bad at every different step of the way. That if, you're, if you're a criminal, you get rewarded. And if you're honest, you get killed or put in jail or, 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 or exiled. And when you stand back from this, so, so, so as I understand, it, if I listen to you and I understand that correctly, Bill, you're saying, look, you haven't, you haven't given up on capitalism, but you have become much more alive and alert to the scale of corruption, not just in Russia, but elsewhere. Is that, is that fair? Well, I, I, I would say that capitalism in its rawest form doesn't work. I mean, Russia is its rawest form. It just like turns into criminality. You need governments, you need regulations, you need rules, and so on. And so um, capitalism can only work if you, so it's kind of, it, if you have the, the right institutions in place. And in the West, um, we don't necessarily have all the right institutions in place. Like I've been trying to get people prosecuted in different countries for money laundering connected to the Magnitsky crime. Mm -hmm. And I'm discovering that, um, the, the skills and, and the um, willingness and, and so on to do anything doesn't exist in many countries, including the UK, for example. So where, just, yes, so, so, so yes, yeah, go on in the UK, go on, sorry. I'm the UK um, is one of the countries that's received the, the, the most money from the Magnitsky case, the, the crime that Sergei uncovered, and the, the National Crime Agency has refused to open a criminal investigation, whereas 16 other countries have. And, and so I, I've, I've seen how the institutions and, and we're seeing this right now with, this, with, with coronavirus, which is all of our institutions that we relied on don't really work. I mean, everything we kind of come to, to think um, should be there in governments uh, aren't. I mean, and, and it, it's true with, with fighting mafia, fighting money laundering, fighting criminality, and it's true in, in fighting this virus, which everything we, we sort of counted on it hasn't, hasn't really, we haven't been able to rely on. And, um, and, and so when it comes to capitalism, anyways, I think that um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of flaws in the system. And, um, having said that, I think that communism is far worse, but, but um, uh, I've, seen, I've seen the very bad side of capitalism from this whole experience with Russia. Well, well um, Bill, uh, you, you won't have seen because you've been talking, but there has been an absolute waterfall of comments and questions, and I've tried to feed in as many as possible. Uh, I know there are more that, 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 that could have been asked. Um, if you go to a news meeting in a newsroom, um, often the best bit is actually the bit after the star turn, in this case, Bill Browder leaves the room and everyone says, what do you think of that? Um, right. You're thinking, if you like, the way that works is that we're supposed to say, here's what we thought of that. And, and my job as the editor is to try and say, well, listen, this is where it takes us journalistically. And it's funny, Bill, because uh, I suppose that knowing the story and knowing you and how you've campaigned for years, I didn't expect to come away thinking about things that I hadn't predict predicted thinking about at all. Um, I was surprised but completely understood your point about oil price and the impact that that might have on, on Russia. And given our obsession, understandably, with coronavirus, the extent to which we're missing, how that might change the balance of power and, and Putin's hold. Um, I was really struck, and it's an obvious point, and I should 
probably be better informed, but I was really struck, not just by the asymmetry of the warfare, but by the cheapness of doing things that are deeply, deeply disruptive and very powerful. Um, and I suppose I'm really struck by the extent to which I feel, you know, as, as I said at the top, so obsessed by what's happening closer to home that I'm missing the way in which for some people, this pandemic is an opportunity uh, and it does change the relationship between state and citizens and the fact that we really need to look into, look into that. Um, there was a great uh, question which I didn't uh, get, to, get to, which was about what motivates you. And I did come to the end of it thinking, there's something about you that's so unlikely that, you know, no, people didn't sort of imagine that, that, you know, the person you should get on the wrong side of is a fund manager, right? <laughs> and, that, and that at the end of this, that you would end up being someone with quite such a bee in your bonnet. And, and, and beyond, beyond fighting for justice for Sergei Magnitsky, but beginning to look at corruption. And so with the question which was, you know, where do you go from here? I hope that the best I can do is ask you that given the work that you continue to do, not just with your book, but around corruption internationally, that you'll come back and that we can continue that conversation beyond Russia, but, but internationally too. Um, yeah. this, is, this is a slightly awkward bit. Much of this digital thinking works. This last bit really doesn't because normally you would get the response from the room. People would applaud you and thank you and then ask you to sign their books. At this stage, <laughs> what we can do is wave cheerfully at you um, but please, uh, everyone, join me on the call by thanking Bill Browder with a cheerful wave goodbye. Thank Good you. Night. Bill, thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.